Dr. Dorsey, one big part of your book and one thing that was kind of outrageous was you spent a lot of time in your book talking about TCE, trichloroethylene, uh, paraquat, um, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it, chloro something. Or paraquat, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, can you tell us the story of these? What's going on? What, where do these come from? Why do they exist? How much do you feel they're involved with Parkinson's? Uh, is this just a minor thing or a major thing? Tell us why you, um, what you found about these. Yeah, so I think they're a major thing. Uh, Parkinson's disease was 200 years ago when Dr. James Parkinson described it in London Rare. He said, I'm describing something. He was 62 years old, by the way. So if you're 62, you're not going to write about something unless it's really getting you pissed off or something catches your eye. And he says, I'm describing something that's not been classified in the medical literature. So he's the son of a physician. He's a physician himself. He's saying that I'm describing something that hasn't been classified in the medical literature. 200 years later, exactly 200 years later, is the world's fastest growing brain disease. So how do you go from something that's rare to something that's the world's fastest growing brain disease in 200 years? It can't be genetics. It has to be in the environment. And all these environmental toxins, many of these pesticides, and this chemical called trichloroethylene, very simple, six <laughs> atoms. Uh, two carbons in black, one hydrogen in white, and three chlorine, since its name in green, are all target the energy producing parts of cells called mitochondria. And in the year 2000, uh, one of my uh, colleagues and co author, uh, Dr. Todd Scher, and others wrote this uh, powerful uh, paper identifying that a naturally occurring pesticide, wrote known, uh, also a mitochondrial toxin, uh, reproduced the features of Parkinson's when fed to laboratory animals. These things are around us everywhere. I told you Paraquat is uh, found on throughout the United States. Its uh, use is, exceeds 15 million pounds. Use in the United States has uh, more than doubled in the last uh, five years. Uh, trichloroethylene, uh, two pounds per person were produced in the 1970s, uh, using everything from decaffeinating coffee to dry cleaning to degreasing. A study in Italy found that uh, found three quarters of People had TCE in their urine. If you used whiteout, if you used, if you drank Sanka coffee, if you used a, uh, a, a carpet cleaner, if you were in Silicon Valley, if you're one of 10 million Americans who worked with this chemical, um, you've likely been exposed uh, to TCE. It's found in half of Superfund sites throughout the United States, found in thousands of other sites, including three that I know of in the city of Rochester, including one 15 minutes from my house in my suburban. Uh, Rochester. It's, I didn't know about it until I read, uh, until I was doing the research for the book. You know, we're not even taught about it uh, in uh, medical school. My guess is Dale's probably never even heard of it. And he was trained at the best medical schools in, in the country, if not the world. Uh, but these chemicals are around us and they're fueling the rise of uh, Parkinson's disease. And this one uh, also causes uh, as a known carcinogen and causes liver, kidney, uh, cancer, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, multiple myeloma, and prostate cancer. And I learned about it from your book. Uh, <laughs> so thank you for that. Uh, and perchloroethylene as well. And the whole list that you gave in the book, which was really fantastic. And I'd love to see a list that has, here are the ones that actually impact, you know, uh, complex one more than the others. Because I think this is, again, things that are unrecognized. People show up to the doctor, they have Parkinson's, they say, we don't know why you got it. And we should know why you got it. And, and um, I'll, I'm going to apologize now. I got to sign off at this point. But I, I really appreciate. Fantastic to hear the questions. Fantastic to to be with these experts here. And thank you so much uh, for putting together this wonderful conference. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Dr. Bradson. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Take care, guys. Uh, so continuing then. Um, so, Dr. Dorsey, just why is this available? In other words, if you're saying uh. that this stuff is <laughs> that you're reading science that's clearly correlating with health conditions, in this case, Parkinson's, with specific, um, let's call pesticides, chemicals. Um, you're just saying that that's just how it is. No one has the power to um, change anything. The government, the government agencies, the EPA, this is a prof big profitable industries and no one has an interest in changing anything. So we just let it go into our food and our water and that's that. Is that what's oh. happening? So one, I don't think it's just correlation. So if you feed this uh, to mice or rats in the laboratory, they develop the pathological features of uh, Parkinson's disease. So you look at their brains, they look like they have Parkinson's disease. Some even develop a little tremor in their paws when you feed this to them. Likewise with Paraquat, you feed it to laboratory animals and they develop the clinical and pathological features of uh, Parkinson's disease. 
even when you feed this to mice, they start becoming less um, active, they walk less. Um, so I think it goes beyond just correlation, more research is needed, but I think it's more than that. Uh, and then we've changed the world uh, before. Um, you know, we don't have C chlorofluorocarbons cor destroying our ozone layer uh, anymore. Uh, we don't have, uh, we have seat belts, we have airbags. Uh, it just takes uh, people to find their voice and say enough of this nonsense. Uh, who's holding the EPA accountable? Uh, I've never seen a million people with Parkinson's disease march on, in Washington, D.C. at the EPA. I, I don't, um, we've seen that done for HIV. We saw a national quilt uh, cover the, uh, the national, I'm sorry, memorial quilt cover the National Mall. And that at the same time, there was no federal response to HIV. Today, HIV receives $3 billion per year of research funding. HIV is preventable. There are many people on listening and to hear who don't have HIV because of the uh, heroism and courage of HIV activists that were part of ACT UP and changed the course of HIV. We need to do the same thing for brain diseases. If we do that, we'll change the course of brain diseases, not just for us, but for future generations. Boy, I'd sure love to see that happen. And I 100% agree with you. Trichloroethylene is a nasty, persistent chemical. It should have been banned long ago. And I have no idea how it could not be. But I, I do remember also that Dr. Bredesen mentioned fatty fish. And that made me think of polychlor uh, PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls. And we know that polychlorinated biphenyls were outlawed in 1977, but they're still persistent in the environment. And they were replaced by polybrominated diphenyl ethers, which are every bit as bad. Both of these really seem to damage tyrosine hydroxylase, which damages our ability to make levodopa in our brains. And they've been very closely associated with Parkinson's disease. What have you seen about PCBs and other uh, organochlorine pesticides and their relationship to that? Now, unfortunately, these can't be withdrawn because they're already in the environment and they're already banned. Yeah, so some of these things live on, like uh, as Dr. Blake was indicating, DDT is still found, it was banned, I think 1970s, still found uh, in the environment. Uh, and some of these are fat soluble, some of these pesticides like organic chlorines are fat soluble. Um, we find them in the brain, uh, as Dr. Blake indicated, you know, the other place that we find them, the only other place you excrete uh, fatty liquid is uh, nursing women when they are feeding their babies. So you can find, levels of these pesticides in the breast milk of nursing women who are feeding these pesticide laden breast milk to their uh, babies who have developing and relatively unprotected brains. Um, I saw your reference to uh, heptachlor in your book. Yes, yeah. yeah. so I, I think there's a, uh, this is all around us and I think it's not coincidental that, you know, Parkinson's disease is rising so rapidly when we have these pesticides, synthetic pesticides largely developed as, at following World War II. You so would you say that the omega-3s in fish outweigh the pollutants in fish? I know a lot of the studies are showing both that the omega-3s in fish are helpful cardiovascular, but create more cancer and brain damage. Which one, Dr. Dorsey, would you say is it better or worse? Or isn't it ways? crazy that isn't it crazy we're asking this question that we're making trade-offs based on what uh, are the contaminants to do it? The answer is to get rid of the contaminants so that we don't have to answer these questions. I think, though, meanwhile we may need to stay away from the fish that have these <laughs> contaminants in and will have them for the rest of our lifetimes. Um, regarding the DDT, that's. Um, concentrates in our brains, if we're trying to get rid of chemicals from our body, is a far red infrared sauna seven days a week um, a solution to get chemicals and pesticides out of your body? And if not, is there anything that works to do that, to get the chemicals out of your body? Well, time will get the pesticides out of your body. I would rather prefer that people are exercising to sweat and the sweat gets rid of the, some of the toxins but it is really best not to take them in. If you don't eat animal fat, your concentration of these persistent organic pollutants will go down. And this has been shown in study after study. There's been some great studies on that. So we can get them to go down over time if we stop eating them. But as long as we continue to eat them, they're gonna to continue to circulate in our body, bioaccumulate in our brain, just like they do in the environment. Some of these environmental pollutants like PCBs 
there's a book called Aquatic Pollution written by a professor at University of Hawaii. And he's showing bioaccumulation of 100,000 times in some predatory birds compared to what's in the ocean. That's a lot of bioaccumulation. And that, the heptachlor crisis on Maui, which we had where they, they took, they sprayed heptachlor on the pineapples, cut the tops off and fed them to the cows. And just as Dr. Dorsey said, the women's milk should have been illegal that they were breastfeeding their children because it's so much of these organochlorine brain destroying cancer causing pesticides in them. Yeah, I agree with uh, Dr. Blake. The key is to get, prevent, is to reduce intake of these. Uh, other things you can uh, do is a carbon filter on water can uh, decrease your exposure to pesticides and TCE. Uh, washing fruits and vegetables with uh, uh, water and a little bit of soap uh, can uh, help reduce your exposure, but we need policy actions uh, to prevent people uh, getting exposed to this because it's, um, you know, there's only so much uh, individuals can do. Uh, yeah, Dr. and also it's um, outside of dicambra, which is the only organochlorine I think that's still in use, the other ones are no longer uh, registered and being sprayed, they're just everywhere. And so what we can do is if we eat plants, we don't get the bioaccumulation high levels. We get very low levels. But if we're eating animal fat, it's guaranteed to have high levels of these pollutants. So there's a lot we can do to lower our risk of these two brain diseases and cancer and many other problems too.